this session uh, will go from now until uh, approximately 12.30. Um, and this session is going to be focused on uh, data issues that can impact uh, genomic CDS. Um, at the outset, I want to just, um, uh, you know, let everybody know that, you know, we do understand the fact that these are not necessarily, necessarily uh, separable items, that data does relate to knowledge representation, which does relate to implementation. Um, and so we expect that in the course of the discussion that uh, we will begin to identify some of those uh, state transitions. Um, but we do want to try and uh, maintain focus as much as we can, and then uh, it'll be uh, up to Blackford and, and me to, uh, at the end of the day, begin to uh, synthesize the discussion from these uh, three different areas into uh, what's going to um, TSF for uh, tomorrow. Oh, and I also want to uh, introduce uh, uh, a, a new, uh, the, the late uh, Dr. Eric Green. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that my arrival time or yes, my demise? Yes, yes, it is your arrival time. Oh, I'm okay. sure it has something to do with the Cardinals, but uh, uh, Nothing to do with the Cardinals. Please, Eric, uh, uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes here if you uh, want to just introduce yourself and uh, say anything, any pithy remarks. Oh, w wow, okay. Well, I am I'm late not because of my baseball Cardinals. I am late because of an uh, uh, institute director's meeting that got scheduled at uh, the last minute. Uh, sorry that I am here late, but I'm delighted to be here. Thanks to the folks that have put a lot of work into getting this meeting up and going. I appreciate it, and um, I'm really looking forward to the discussions we're going to have over the next uh, day or a little over a day now. But Great. Thank thanks. you, Eric, and thank you for being here. So I'm going to turn this over to our um, uh, session moderators, uh, Bob Freimuth and uh, Jim Estelle. They're going to um, set up um, the discussion. I will be in charge of um, uh, keeping uh, track of uh, people that want to contribute to the discussion, so continue to try and uh, flag me, particularly for those of you behind, throw things at me or, uh, you know, do whatever needs to be done to get my attention and we'll make sure we get you uh, in. I am keeping a list of order. Uh, so um, uh, if, as I, if I see you, I'll try and acknowledge that and add you to the queue. All right. Thank you, Mark. So as, as Mark mentioned, Jim and I are going to be moderating this session. The summary of the session is shown up on the slide. Uh, we are talking specifically about data issues that impact genomic CDS. For those that don't know me, uh, welcome. Look forward to a really invigorating discussion here. My name is Bob Freemuth. I'm from Mayo Clinic. My background is in uh, pharmacogenomics on the wet lab side, discovery and characterization. I spent some time doing functional prediction and bioinformatics and have since moved into the clinical side looking at application, data standards, knowledge management, and uh, systems to support genomic CDS. So I'm, I'm coming at this from a variety of perspectives. My co-moderator is Jim. Jim I'll I'm Jim Ostell. Um, I'm the branch chief for the part of NCBI that builds all the production resources, which is as diverse as PubMed and PubMed Central, but also to the short read archive and GenBank and ClinVar and the genetic testing registry that are relevant to this. Um, my background is actually as a molecular biologist who accidentally discovered I needed computers. <clears throat> um, and uh, I've been really at NCBI for the last 30 years. Um, and uh, my interest in this uh, is, uh, or my expertise really is more on sort of the data central resource um, uh, genetics uh, side. So the way we're going to set this uh, session up, um, and you'll note it's called a panel. Uh, but the table up at the front that has four chairs for panelists is currently empty. That's because all of us are the panelists. So congratulations, in addition to being, uh, being labeled as a thought leader, which you can put on your CV, you can also say that you are a panelist for this session. Um, the way this is going to work is that we have a, a few questions which are outlined in the agenda and shown up on the slide here. And uh, we're going to use these as a framework to guide the discussion for the next 90 minutes. Uh, we have a few uh, outcomes, a, a few goals for this session that we'd like to try to hit on for each of these three questions. Jim and I will do our best to try to make sure that we cover all the bases as we go here, but largely it's going to be an open discussion uh, by the group. So just to remind you, the stated objectives for the, uh, for the workshop in general were threefold. Uh, 
Uh, the first, dealing with defining gaps and strategies to close those gaps. The second, to identify health IT initiatives that support recommended strategies. And the third, to help define a prioritized research agenda for genomic CDS. So with those three things in mind, we're going to go through the three questions that are shown on the screen here. The first deals with data types that are essential for genomic CDS. The second has to do with the nature of genetic data. And the third has to do with uh, challenges that might be unique to genomics data and its application through genomic CDS. So with that said, uh, Jim and my job is going to be to throw things out uh, as, as topics for discussion and let that discussion ensue. We'll try to stay out of the way as much as possible and just uh, make sure that we stay on track and keep hitting the points that we need to hit. So the first question is related to data types being essential for genomic CDS. And I would add to this, do standard representations for these data exist? Where are the gaps in these rep uh, standardized representations? Uh, and I will hearken back to Dan's talk this morning related to what information is needed to help make a clinician make a decision. Um, beginning first with uh, patient level and clinical data, what sort of things might we need to hit on and uh, what standardized representations would we need to facilitate genomic CDS for these? Please. I would first like to point out regarding standards that there are multiple layers of standards. So we usually talk about genomic standards, which usually emerge from large-scale project where standardization is a, uh, an outcome of uh, an attempt to profile, uh, to compile a large number of profiles, genomic profiles, and interpret them. The second layer is actually a wider standard, which is uh, dictated by bodies such as the W3C Consortium, World Wide Web Consortium, which sets the standards for uh, knowledge representation, uh, such as semantic web technologies, which are used for ontologies uh, and other knowledge representation systems. Uh, it also sets standards for data linking, such as Link Data Platform 1.0, which uh, describes how uh, interoperability can be achieved uh, in terms of for sharing knowledge. And so there are at least these two layers of standards, one more narrow, genomic specific, another uh, uh, evolving in the wider community. Uh, the third may be specific for electronic health records, and that's the one that they have least uh, knowledge about, but others may comment about it. Yeah. Sandy. I'd argue that the, that the knowledge that you, that the data that you need really varies by the clinical, the specific clinical decision support rule that you're seeking to implement. But the types of things that you could wind up needing are knowledge on exactly what variants were found in this patient represented in an unambiguous way, um, data on what regions of interest were assessed by a test, um, again, represented in an unambiguous way, um, and then the interpretation of variants, how variants were classified, the overall interpretation of the test, and what um, how that test has been assessed relative to diseases, again, needing to be represented in, in a way that you can rely on. Um, and I do think, I, I strongly believe in, in everything that was said in the previous session related to the need for shareable um, representations of knowledge and shareable representations of clinical decision support. But in terms of actually beginning the process of implementing a clinical decision support rule, I think that this patient state and obtaining it reliably is often sort of the first step and very difficult to do right now. So, Sandy, if I can um, extend that a bit um, in the context of this discussion about data, because um, uh, I agree with you, I think that, you know, that the, we've talked about that uh, from a patient context, patient state, you know, this um, ability of the, uh, of the environment to recognize when a certain rule needs to happen and we've implemented this in a relatively prosaic way, which is if I order a medication, then I can look for specific genomic variants that might impact that medication. I mean, that's about as simple as it gets, but I think we're talking about things more uh, completely. C can you give your thoughts about um, data uh, that would be relevant 
to the patient state, or does it really encompass the entire universe of data that is uh, captured in the course of uh, clinical encounters? Yeah, so my thought is it really depends on the clinical decision support rule itself. So, for example, if the clinical decision support rule is I've learned something new about a variant and I want to make sure that I get that knowledge to all clinicians where that variant was identified, then I need to make sure that I can identify that I have the data on where that variant was identified and, and, and that I can act on that data. If there's a test that has, if I want to make sure that a specific region of the genome was, was assessed before a drug is ordered because there's a pharmacogenomic effect that needs, to be, that needs to be looked at, then we need to know what regions of interest were represented in, in, in that test. Um, if I want to know whether um, a patient has had a genetic test that assess the specific disease, then, then, then I, need to, I need to know that. Am I, am I answering your question, Mark? Yeah, I think so. And um, if I can, I, I know Jim is going to get in here as well, but um, uh, this gets to, I think, one of the issues that we were talking about right before we went to break, which is the idea of, in some ways, I mean, what you're describing is a necessary element for all CDS. Um, and I think we can probably all agree to that, that each individual CDS rule needs to understand all of the specific elements, including those that are present and those that are missing. Um, and so in some ways, uh, one of the things that we're trying to think about is um, since genome can't take on all of CDS, um, what are the things uh, within uh, the realm of genomics that perhaps are not currently represented in, uh, in data, either because of standardization issues, as was pointed out, or um, uh, because of technical issues, uh, and how does that relate to the point that you're making? Yeah, so, so I think that all of these different elements of information about what has been done from a genetic testing perspective on this patient needs to be, we, we need to get that represented in, in structured form. And I think that that is, I mean, it's in some ways it's general to, it's a general CDS problem because CDS always needs the base data that it's going to act on. But it's also a genetic specific problem because these are genetic specific data elements. And I think that part of this is a standards problem. I mean, I, th I think that within each of our institutions, when our institution generated the data that we're going to act on from a CDS perspective, I think it's much easier for us to stand up these CDS rules. When the data was generated by some outside laboratory, I think that we've got many more challenges associated with, with, with doing this well. And to some extent, that's standards, but to some extent, that's also creating, you know, as Adam was talking about, the ecosystem, the, the, the connections and transport mechanisms for getting this data to move, um, which involves setting up processes and, and, and infrastructure of various types. Um, yeah, I struggled with the same question about what are we going to talk about here. Um, and so to help me think about it, um, I tried to follow the, the suggestion here and imagine the ideal case and then try to sort of backtrack from that. So. My ideal here, if we, say, take the simplifying assumption that we're just talking about a germline genome, is that um, when you're born, we sequence your genome. <clears throat> um, somebody does. Um, that's, and, and I would say uh, it's not the perfect worlds because it's not a perfect genome, let's say, where the technology is not perfect yet, but it's, it's comprehensive as opposed to region-specific testing. Um, the reads are put somewhere. Um, and uh, there is a group of, in the research community, w coupled with the clinical community, who actually evaluates sort of best practices once every two years or three years or something. And every set of reads in, the, um, in this central place are then reassembled, realigned to the new set of references using whatever the current best practice is, the, um, the variants are recalled, and those are made available. Um, 
And then the clinical decision support step begins with, we took best practice reads at this point in time, and now we're applying sort of the knowledge of the connection to phenotype and genotype. And this thing continues to cycle in the background. And to me, that's sort of what's unique. That's trying to separate what's unique about a genomic CDS from any other CDS, where you're going to also need to know demographics and family history and, and all the other things. And, and so my question is, how unrealistic is that? Uh, how far away is it? Is every hospital going to store the reads and assemble them and change with each new technology? Uh, does this, because the genome persists over time, at least the germline genome, is it going to be reanalyzed automatically as technologies change? Will we be notified? So sort of in that world, because I'm thinking we're not going to resolve this particular issue in the next year. <laughs> so um, maybe in five years we're actually in that domain. So, um, James, I think that, that what you're describing in the current state is completely unrealistic. And, um, and I think that's one of the issues that, that Sandy is trying to, to, to get at. And um, the, the questions here are, are kind of what is the clinical decision support engine going to fire off of? And you're proposing that it fires off of the raw reads. Um, but there, right now, there are many, many intervening steps in between that. And I think that that's, that's really the challenge is defining what those intervening steps are and what level standards needs to be, what, what standardization needs to happen to have those intervening steps. So just, just to correct, I, I'm saying it would fire the, off of the called variants. So, 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 there's, so, so it's fired off of the called variants, um, and even that may be somewhat unrealistic because there are so many different, uh, different varieties of called variants in an individual gene, and in order to be able to support that number of rules, um, even with a large nationwide group, uh, you know, large nationwide group of people working on it may be untenable. And so there, there could be standards for saying, you know, what, how are the individual calls reported? And then other standards for saying, how are these individual calls classified? And if you go, you know, that that's, was my initial question about the Siderata, is, is there a separation between the calls and the classification and the clinical decision support. And right, what, what's lacking right now, and what actually I, I, I love the concept of ClinVar, and I think that it's, it's moving towards where it's, it's, it can be actionable, but one of the steps that's missing there is that piece of standardized, um, standardized clinical uh, um, interpretations that can be fed into clinical decision support. So someone can say, I have this CYP2D6 variant and or, or this, uh, any number of CYP2D6 variants and all of these variants fit into this clinical classification that then a clinical decision support engine can say, all I need to fire off of is the, uh, I can be aware of what the, the variant is, but the rule fires off of the classification and any number of variants that have that class. So that, that at least from what I see right now, is completely missing. And I see components of ClinVar that, that may lead into that, but I don't see them structured and robust enough in, in a way it kind of thinking, could these potentially be used as flags for clinical decision support? And I, would, I would encourage you to think about ClinVar as, a, as moving in that direction to say between um, gene and um, condition and clinical, I'm, I'm looking at clinical right now, clinical significance or some, between those th three flags, um, someone can fire a, a, a clinical decision support rule that would be informative. Yeah, and I think to some degree that, you know, this is one of the uh, key things that we're focusing on in the ClinGen project, which is to try, because we, we've, we've all recognized that um, as, as useful as ClinVar is, it does not have that. And so I think, you know, it's not to say that that's not within the purview of discussion, and there's, there's clearly a lot more to do, but there's at least some intentionality in terms of trying to, you know, create that type of uh, knowledge repository. Now, again, it's another gap to say, well, now how do we get CDS to fire off of whatever that is going to end up uh, looking like? Absolutely. But it's great that you're thinking about that in the end. Thank you. I just, yeah, Jim, go ahead. 
Um, yeah, so ClinVar by design is not expected to get all the way up to clinical disparity. It's, it's really intended to be the, a layer on which you build that classification. Um, so it's meant to be sort of the broad collection. Uh, and, I, and, uh, and there's other people here involved in ClinGen, which is sort of that tier, next tier that you're talking about, um, and we should let them talk. But the other thing I want to be clear about my proposal sort of thing was sort of, I, I'm assuming that we do, we collect the genome, we call the variants, there is a resource like ClinVar, there is a resource which has the classifications. Those also need to be reviewed. I, I wasn't thinking you start as low as the called read. Uh, wh what I was proposing is rather sort of what's, what are the central resources? Where does the data reside? Um, is it within every hospital? Um, you know, and at what point do you branch from uh, sort of a common pooled set of operations and data storage to what happens within each care facility. Where does that, that happen? Um, just to comment in our clinical setting that I'm part of um, at MCW Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, um, if there was no diagnosis, we actually will do a reanalysis, um, normally a six month or a yearly um, intervals. Actually, in our case, triggered by the request of the patient to come back in if no diagnosis was made. And at that time, we will go all the way back to the read data if our pipelines have changed significantly. Um, so everything from the read through the variant calling, through the bringing in of the reference data gets updated at that point in time. So there is a huge flux of data that I don't think perhaps is seen in some of the other clinical decision support settings. And, and that can be every six months for each patient. Now, we don't trigger, the informatics doesn't trigger us to um, reanalyze and therefore potentially come up with some more uh, actionable data for that patient is triggered by the patient coming back in because we don't think it's appropriate to be emailing every doctor every time one of the pieces of data changes because they would get hundreds of emails a week saying you need to go and find this patient to tell them the data has changed and it may have an impact on their clinical care. We think that's too onerous on the healthcare system currently. Yeah, although I'm, um, and I, I have everybody in the queue here, but I, I want to um, uh, uh, get to uh, Sandy and Heidi because this is something that, um, uh, you know, they've been looking at, again, more from a traditional single genetic test perspective, which is as we, you know, call something as a variant of uncertain significance and that variant classification changes, you know, there have been some approaches of saying, well, when we know it's really important enough to flag to a clinician, you know, how might that be done? So uh, I'm assuming that you're raising your hand to talk to that specific issue? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One is, you know, when we think about genomic data, it exists in various levels of quality. And so the, you know, the clinical decision support environment that we've supported that has automatic firing when knowledge changes is only operating off of validated, confirmed variants, right? So that we know that patient has that variant, and then we can focus on knowledge changes in an easy way. I think the challenge we all deal with is when we're dealing with the whole genome or exome or large regions that haven't been specifically interpreted and reported with validated variants, that we, there's a quality issue. And right now, the standard is you don't put the whole genome in the medical record because so much of that data is not correct, right? Um, and I think this the issue you brought up, Jim, with the reads, my feeling is that in order to build an environment that really would enable you to sort of in real time almost query the reads and have them reanalyzed at a later point to then see what's accurately there, I, I think our technology is, is changing fast enough that the effort to build such an interactive system would not be worth it because I think we're going to eventually hopefully get to high quality variant calls sooner than the need to have a system supporting reanalysis of read data. Um, but, but getting back to some extent to Sandy's point, you know, context of accessing and what information you access from this data is really critical. So if context is firing a direct knowledge support rule, you have to have validated variants. If context is did the patient have their BRCA1 gene analyzed at all because they just conveyed to me a family history of breast cancer? 
you, you may be able to tolerate a different level of quality of understanding of the BRCA1 and 2 genes to just simply say, were they sequenced? Is there data somewhere? And then this question of, were any variants possibly found? And does that change the a priori likelihood that my patient sitting in front of me actually has a real and high risk for breast cancer? And maybe you even want to be able to say, it, was there a variant called in there that wasn't automatically ruled out as benign with high frequency data, even though I can't trust it because nobody confirmed it and it might be a false positive, do you allow a world to actually interact and say, was the area sequenced and was there any variants called that might potentially be pathogenic, but not allowing that physician to act on what was not a technically confirmed result. And I, that's where I see an incredible challenge of allowing any access to unconfirmed data, yet trying to support these questions that will come into the clinicians on a routine basis. And I don't know what the perfect answer is. Um, back to the comment uh, talking over here and, and, you know, proposing the system. So we've already uh, proposed the system and built a prototype of it where you separate out the, the decision support knowledge from the, the genome data um, and even have a structure that separates out the interpretations of variants. And, and the decision support looks at the gene and the interpretation as part of the decision support. So simplifying the logic as much as possible because you can't write decision support knowledge that looks at the variants. Practically, you have to just say, let's group these all as pathogenic mutations and run the decision support off of that. So we've proposed that, we've built a prototype of it, we know it works. We've even used ClinVar as that knowledge base to inform the interpretations of the variants. And so I, on Twitter, for all those Twitterites, um, I posted that manuscript of that proposed um, uh, system, so you guys uh, have that link to it. And the, the, descript the paper where we actually built the prototype and evaluated the prototype is coming out in EMEA. Um, this next annual symposium. Yeah, so I, I think that that's, you know, something that um, there's been a lot of discussion in uh, ClinGen uh, related to, uh, to this, and that, you know, in some ways we do have a gene focus, uh, but um, uh, the, the issue with the variant classification, of course, is that um, it's not a binary decision that a variant is, you know, is disease causing or not disease causing, but to some degree there's, you know, even using something like BRCA, the, you know, the impact of a specific variant may be more or less risky, as, and we may develop knowledge about that. So uh, I think that um, uh, we, we may need to, you know, begin to think at the data level about how that type of nuance um, you know, could potentially be constructed even though it may not be necessary or even possible today because our knowledge right. uh, I, is not sufficient. Yeah, and I think if we have something that we, we start off with, um, it might not be perfect, but we build on it line upon line um, and say, look, this is what we have now. Uh, we've got the gene, we've got the interpretation. And then as we use it and uh, get experience with it and find, hey, we have these other nuances, so let's add this. But we can't, we can't wait to know everything possible about genomic interpretation before we do build something. We have to start with what we have now. If it solves 80 percent of what it does, great. We're 80 percent closer to our solution. And then iter iteratively refine and build upon that until we have a full, complete solution. Yeah. I just wanted to build upon actually the last two comments here, and, and that is to say that although we are missing in a very painful way standards that will represent molecular phenotypes in a robust fashion, we need to be careful about how those are constructed. Um, I think there's a, a great amount of consensus towards getting something into place so that we can start standardizing how these things are reported uh, on reports from clinical labs. But at the same time, as our knowledge uh, continues to evolve, the standards that we use, those phenotypic terms and classifications that we use, need to evolve similarly um, in a graceful way so that we can add more of the nuance uh, based on our understanding and, uh, and on the clinical context. Uh, thinking. Well, the, the comment I wanted to offer was um, not being a, an expert in the genomic uh, data representation space, but to make sure as we consider those representational issues for the data and for the, for the gene sequence and variants uh, themselves, is to think about how we might encapsulate that representation in a way that protects it from the, or separates it from the other layers of representation. And secondly, it, it will be useful to have a notion of, you know, certainty attached to these representations. Because the inferential problem might then proceed, you know, sequentially, if you will, from, 
low levels to intermediate levels of representation to high levels. And this is common what we do, commonly what we do, of course, in clinical, regular CDS. You know, the abstraction of the diabetes concept is something the clinician's comfortable with, but underlying that is all, you know, a variety of different levels of understanding. And the clinical decision support rule, you know, check the hemoglobin A1C every six months is interpretable. So I, this, this idea of abstraction and layers and certainty attached to representation would be very helpful on the, when we get to the inference side. I, I think that's right on point. And I think just to take that one step further, we're, we're in a space now where a lot of the interpretation that layers over genomics is probabilistic. And it's probabilistic because it's based on population measures. But to an individual patient that's sitting in an exam room, they're an N of one, the probabilities don't matter. I don't care what happens in the general population. Tell me what's going to happen to me. So I think you're exactly right. We need to have ways of expressing not only the, uh, the precision with which those interpretations are made, but also give uh, the clinician the tools that they can use to translate those population metrics down into a patient level. Yeah, so I wanted to comment on your uh Will, will the hospital keep the data? And I think, you know, we have to think about the genome being much more portable. It's, it's about the individual, not about the health care provider. And, you know, patients go to multiple health care providers over their lifetime. So we have to make it easily available to those health care providers, not necessarily always in a situation where we're just basically spitting out the knowledge of a CDS and saying this is what you should do but having the data maintained using good data management principles in such a way that if we find a new genetic variant that is important in a particular disease, that that particular piece of data can be reanalyzed by whatever healthcare provider is trying to, to look at that. The other thing is, and you know, whether it's cloud solutions or uh, distributed computing environments, it, it really comes down to when you look at a lot of these variants, I mean, uh, genome-wide association studies have, have demonstrated, I think, fairly clearly that the common variants that we all tried to look at over the years have not necessarily proven very fruitful. And what we are now kind of looking at is saying, well, should we concentrate more on the rare genetic variants? But when we concentrate on rare genetic variants, we're talking about very limited populations where those genetic variants exist, and therefore understanding phenotype and genotype relationships can be very difficult. So coming up with not only a portable genome that allows for easy access to healthcare providers and patients themselves, but also having centralized, and I'm going to say databases just for not, not having another term, that allow us to continually look at genotype and phenotype markers and how they do relate to each other, even when they're very rare, it, it's not going to be feasible with one healthcare provider to, to do that. It really behooves us to now look at this more on a population scale and how will we really understand what are the decision support mechanisms we can put in place based on a continuous knowledge base. The problem with the continuous knowledge base, as I see it, is the fact that we do not have standardized sharing of clinical data from healthcare systems into central repositories. We are not talking just about an EMR. So when we talk about outcomes, rarely are they captured discreetly. They're in physician notes and other types of, uh, of documentation within an EMR or without, outside of the EMR, such as radiological systems. And so we're really looking at this as more of a holistic approach of how do we gather data not just genomic data, but phenotype data, clinical data, associate that so that we can start actually making reasonable decisions about what the genetic variations we see uh, within the genomes are actually doing from not just a disease perspective, but also from a health perspective. Thanks. So I, I hear uh, uh, a, a bit of an echo of the uh, adaptability that, you know, it, it's sharing not only important to, you know, to push out information, but also then to capture, as Dan was talking about, you know, what are the outcomes and, and synthesize that knowledge across to everyone so that we can learn more uh, rapidly. Um, so thanks. Uh, Mark, I have you next. I think um, coming out of the commercial EHR world that one of the considerations that we had to focus on is that an EHR is a legally binding medical record and that one of its roles is to reproduce the information available at the time that a decision was made in case there was a malpractice lawsuit and so forth. And this whole um, dynamic, fluid state of knowledge, I think, 
I get concerned when we talk about called variance versus expert interpreted results, which is more of the standard that the, the legally binding aspect has to, to fulfill. Um, so I almost wonder if a 15th element of the desiderata should be that the, the framework has to fit into the, we have to fit into the current legal framework, which, which has that, that threshold of, of fulfilling some, some legal obligations. And so if a result was interpreted today, new knowledge is available tomorrow, but that result was not reinterpreted, how does the CDS know which version to adhere to? Legally, it has to res respond to the old um, state of interpretation. And I think um, in the big data world, veracity is an element of big data, but it's not one that we put enough attention to, but that data provenance as well as the, the context provenance, I think that's a really critical element for, for these discussions. Uh, thinking about genomic data and uh, use cases, uh, I'm proposing a use case where individual uh, information is shared between physicians in the context of care. For example, uh, I, have a, I have a colleague who asked me, and I have a patient with an autoimmune disease uh, mutation, gene mutation, she's in six months of pregnancy, what I can expect uh, in the next three months. And, uh, he has sent somebody else seen a patient with a similar mutation and what happened. What was the treatment? What was the outcome? And I've talked to a few of you who are compiling uh, cancer mutation databases where certain tumor profiles were treated and physicians may be interested in sharing information about similar cases. So this is the case where, you know, there's an incentive for data sharing and genomic data is part of the picture. So um, in that context, you know, there is the issue of what is the data at the genomic profiling level that uh, should be shared in order to inform treatment of a patient. And the second is how to represent the, uh, the, the non-genomic parts of the data. And there, uh, I would say that there, there are a lot of technologies emerging uh, that can handle with the kind of messy, non-standard, semi-standard descriptions of disease phenotypes, conditions, and so on. I have particular in mind uh, simple knowledge organizations system, uh, SKOS schema, which is emerging as a standard on, on the World Wide Web as a, share, a method of sharing different concept schemas, for example, descriptions of conditions, diseases, and so on, that can actually live a, 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 and link, help us link data in this messy world and identify similar cases across different institutions. And I would add to that, um, reflecting on what Mark had just said, also safe harbors for sharing, uh, given some of the legal restrictions that we have about sharing certain types of data at the present time. Jamie, I think I had you next. Yeah, I just want to piggyback on one of the comments that you, the comments that you were saying about, you know, the importance of the CDS not just going back to the patient, uh, to the providers, but to the patients as well. And so I just want to revisit really quickly. Uh, number 10 in the list of desideratas um, in that CDS knowledge must have the capacity to support multiple EHR platforms. I'd cross out EHR and start thinking about HIT platforms. I see Brandon shaking his head, so we may take that as a friendly amendment, I don't <laughs> uh, Jim, Um So in the old-fashioned, if we could call it old-fashioned clinical decision support, it was the triggers for decision support were an event like writing an order or the arrival of a lab result. Now the triggers are going to be new knowledge, uh, where the, the drug order has already been placed, patients on the drug and something new comes in and suggests that we should modify that order. So we're going to have to figure out how to handle this, you know, once every X months we get a new set of a new knowledge base, suddenly there's going to be 50 pages of alerts on every patient in the system. How we're going to operationalize that? So, um, just wanted to comment uh, a few things for the non-genomic part of standards. I, I understand we shouldn't and don't want to focus on it, but there are a lot of work going on. A lot of it um, coordinated by the ONC related really to meaningful use, EHR certification criteria, et cetera. So, I just want to make sure that folks were aware there is a big body of work there and we should align in particular with what uh, ONC is uh, uh, working on. And my observation is the community, t it looks like, including the vendor community, is starting to coalesce around fire. That's the sense I get, so just to um, bring that up. 
Um, with regard to the genomic data, I have a question for the, from the, uh, it seems like there's a tension between saying the g genetic and the genomic raw data should be outside the EHR and maintained separately, and the notion of it needs to be part of the legal record. I, I just was, wanted to bring that up. I, I just would like people's thoughts, like, where should it stand, sit? Should, should it be in the EHR or should it not? I'll take a stab. I think in the, in the first Desiderata paper, the, the model is that interpreted data should be in the, e, interp, derived data that's interpreted should be in the EHR. The vast uninterpreted where the clinical significance is not known or appreciated should remain external. So I think it's a, it's a hybrid thought. And then the, the push-pull is that as new interpretations are occurring, and then if they're validated by an expert, then they can be pulled in or amended. So it's a, it's a dynamic um, hybrid model is what I advocate. Yeah, and I think that there, there, there's been some um, uh, writing around that particular issue. I think the other, you know, we, a couple of times we've talked about, you know, again, in the context of alert fatigue, how when we have new knowledge that there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's going to suddenly be filling people's inboxes, I think it's likely that the reality is that while there may be new knowledge that's attached to variants in an individual that's had a, a sequence done, um, there are probably a very tiny subset of those that would need immediate action, that there, there will be a number of things that might then be triggered when appropriate contexts come up, but certainly the work that Les and others have done looking at current parsing of uh, sequences for what we would consider to be truly actionable uh, variants in genes that we understand, or at least think we understand, uh, reasonably well. Um, it's a very tiny fraction of the people, you know, maybe in the range of 2 to 5 percent, depending on the number of genes and, and your, uh, your filters. So uh, I don't know that we should necessarily um, think of w genetics groups like this are great at the worst case scenario thing. We've done it, you know, particularly in the LC space. We, 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 we dream up wonderful uh, worst case scenarios and build to those, whereas that may not always be the most, uh, the most productive. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert, I had you next. One of the things I'd like to do is uh, maybe step back to something that Ken just mentioned, and that is the knowledge representation issue. The representation of knowledge is, in fact, uh, at least in, in my opinion, one type of data. Um, I want to be a little bit careful here because we have an upcoming session on knowledge management immediately following this. But if, if we focus the discussion just to knowledge representation, um, I'm wondering, Ken and Blackford, you've both been very involved with, uh, with this space. I was wondering if you could maybe comment for the group on where we are and where are those gaps. So um, I'll comment on what I'm familiar with. So um, the area we've been working with has been with ONC and CMS, where we've had two what are known as standards and interoperability initiatives. Um, uh, that are public-private, um, sponsored by the federal government to define standards for various things, in our case for patient data models and knowledge representation, and also for interacting with clinical distance support. One was called Healthy Decisions Focused on Distance Support, in, which include the patient data model, a representation for order sets, documentation templates, and event condition action alerts, rules, so alerts, reminders, uh, and also distance support as a service. There's one currently that's funded by ONC and CMS that I'm co-coordinating called Clinical Quality Framework, which is then taking those standards and harmonizing them with standards for quality measurement that you'll see, for example, for um, the current meaningful use quality measures. So in that regard, the data model is currently, it looks like it's converging on the physical representation being FHIR with semi-detailed clinical models. Uh, with a uh, UML representation underlying it that we are calling QUIC for quality uh, improvement and, uh, 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 and uh, clinical knowledge that we just balloted in HL7. Um, so there seems to be fairly good consensus there. Uh, in terms of the knowledge representation, there's a HL7 CDS knowledge artifact specification standard, which is a draft standard right now, uh, which allows for the representation of this kind of logic has a uh, expression language for expressing these logical criteria. Um, and the expectation is, uh, uh, and the, so those are the knowledge representations. There's also a, a standard called HL7 Distance Support Service Standard, which provides a SOAP and REST web service interface for interacting with these kind of knowledge bases. Uh, 
Um, you know, and a lot of these are actually in implemented systems. Some are in commercial EHR systems, in the VA, et cetera. Um, so I guess what I would say with those is it, it is directly in the scope of these items. The main thing is uh, genomic medicine has not been included as a use case. Um, I've thought about it, but it's the kind of thing where you need people who are really behind it to uh, participate. And my, my observation is the genomics community has been pretty absent in these efforts. And I think that's an area where there could be engagement. I would only add a couple of thoughts. Excellent summary, Ken, of the current state. I think the standards are moving forward. But you also asked, Bob, kind of about what is the knowledge management process? You know, on top of the standards and, and this, you know, collection of knowledge, we have to think through, you know, how do we keep the, the provenance of the knowledge, the current state of the knowledge, be able to reproduce the state of knowledge at any time from a discoverability or legal point of view, and to synchronize and coordinate knowledge engineering that might be occurring at these different levels. So that there has to be some recognition of what low-level variant representation looks like and connect it to the intermediate pathophysiologic state and connect that to kind of the, you know, the rule or expression that might come to the, to the end user. And, you know, at Partners Healthcare and at Vanderbilt, I was fortunate enough to be uh, involved with, you know, large knowledge management teams that were focusing on this very problem and they take things like the FDB or new knowledge from guidelines or subject matter experts and then codify that in one of these types of architectures that Ken's described. Um, you know, the challenge actually there is that it, it's, you know, one can do this in a number of different ways, but the expertise associated with actually abstracting evidence from either guidelines <clears throat> or, you know, evidence-based uh, uh, um, data repositories is not well spread across the country. We did an estimate of, of how much it would cost to actually do the knowledge engineering for simple ambulatory clinical decision support, in this context it appears simple, and that alone is about $25 billion if each and every clinic has to rediscover the same hemoglobin A1C alert rule. So the idea of centralization here is also very important, I think, to put on the table to get the synergies of scale. And that's where this, you know, a knowledge repository with these kinds of processes based upon those kinds of standards, Ken's uh, elucidated, uh, would be the goal, from my opinion. So there's another component of genetic genomic knowledge support that I think we haven't talked about a lot, and it's something that we've experienced in supporting our Gene Insight clinic system for four years now that delivers knowledge to uh, physicians based on new genetic variant interpretation. And one of the things we've encountered is that when you're dealing with genomic data that lasts a patient's lifetime, um, it's a whole different timeline than the physician encounter with a patient. And so the ordering physician, in many cases, is not the person you need to alert on. And that may be because it was a passing through resident at the time, or it may be because you've done a genomic analysis and you're delivering breast cancer risk to a cardiologist that ordered a test for cardiomyopathy diagnosis. And, and then, then you have the issue that physicians don't want to be alerted to information when they're no longer caring for the patient because they saw them on a consult basis. Um, and then we had the, another variable doing this when uh, somatic cancer. I'm not going to alert two years later on a variant that was found in a tumor where that tumor is no longer in that same genetic state and likely the patient is deceased. So, you know, thinking about how we e may not necessarily think always about pushing alerts, but instead making new knowledge available so that any cl clinician going into care for a given patient can access whatever knowledge is now available, but not necessarily think that we're going to push it to an ordering physician and that it will always be relevant to that patient given the somatic scenario especially. Yeah, the subscription model, I think, is really viable for the clinical workflow because that way you're not inundating the clinician with alerts and stuff, but two, it also tackles the whole storage issue where that whole genome does not belong inside the EMR, <laughs> doesn't fit. But the things that are relevant given to either it's a long-term problem, so germline lives like your blood type, type line, you know, top line's not going to change, versus something that's more somatic that kind of rolls on, rolls off the flow sheet based on the problem list. So. Yeah, so I, so actually Heidi's point, it, I, I think is strikingly a feature of genomic data, and that is that unlike clinical decision support, which is 
kind of owned and operated by healthcare organizations, this is a feature of yourself, <laughs> right, that persists. And so understanding, um, well, who, if, if something does become actionable because we learn about a particular form of molecular variation and it's downstream and we don't know what healthcare organization you're currently affiliated with, don't we still have a kind of uh, ethical obligation to not simply ignore the data because we don't know which organization is going to act on it. And so I think some kind of model that anticipates maybe that the steward, the final steward, is the individual or their family or either, you know, designate or something in addition to the traditional view that the hospital owns certain classes of data has got to be an important part of this model of how you provide decision support over time when you expect that some things may become actionable that are not actionable now. Yeah, I, th I think this is a really important concept and we had it um, uh, listed on our uh, things is, is you know, the, the role of the patient family in this because I think as Heidi's pointed out and Dan has emphasized, at the present time, at least in, in our system, the only consistent agent is in fact the patient or in some cases the family and so there has to be, um, you know, some recognition that, you know, solutions that operate at a system level and moving data around, uh, at least in our uh, currently disintegrated uh, system, uh, may be, you know, decades uh, away, uh, even under uh, optimal circumstances. So one of the things that, you know, as we get to the implementation piece, uh, would be to say, you know, would there be solutions that would actively engage, uh, you know, the patient family caregiver unit at that central, that, that's central to all of our um, uh, systematic thinking uh, related to uh, delivery of healthcare services, uh, where we could, you know, leverage the knowledge at that point. Uh, it raises a whole different set of, of issues, but I think it's at least something to, um, to put on the table. So I, I just want to add to what Heidi said. I think it's an important when we're talking about data types is to think of traditionally we don't think of the time aspect as an important element of it. So, so even in knowledge representation, um, we, we have to now start thinking about the time, the time aspect and the evolution of symptoms as it applies to a genetic disease. That, you know, when we look at a patient, right, we're just looking at a particular point in time for that patient and that while the patient may have a specific mutation, right, it may not have expressed at that point in time, but could express later in life. Um, our EMR isn't structured to give us that view either. It doesn't give us the whole view, right? It kind of is episodic in terms of when we come in, we look at the episode, we are dealing with something, an episode, and we, and, and we sometimes can miss the point that it's part of a bigger picture and it's part of the evolution towards, you know, the end point. So I, ju I just want to say that when we consider the data types, right, I think we've got to start thinking about the time aspect as a really important element of either knowledge, the knowledge representation itself, as well as the way we structured our, our EHR. I just want to jump in, since it's coming up here, um, that the value of the genome actually is even longer than that. Uh, it applies to the children and the grandchildren and, and on. So if we're going to bring up time, uh, <laughs> Just bear that in mind. <laughs> I just wanted to share some aspects of our experience with um, the system that Heidi was talking about that may be relevant to, to some of the conversations that, that have occurred here. So this is a system that pushes knowledge updates to clinicians when something, when our laboratory records, reclassifies a variant that was previously found in, in their patients. And what we found, this system it, it pushes these knowledge updates in about 3.9 percent of cases per year um, for when, as, as this knowledge evolves. And we have studied this over the last four years, and we found that while there is definite concern about patients moving um, and, and, you know, fear of being overwhelmed with alerts, we do find that clinicians overwhelmingly in the germline space very much appreciate these updates. And, and want, to, um, and want to receive them. In terms of dealing with the, um, the issue of documenting what's, what's happening, the way, that the, the way that that works in this system is there actually is a transaction. There's a knowledge event. It's not signed out by a geneticist because 
of the concern that that would be overwhelming, but there's a transaction that goes into the system that's used by the, the clinician. It's recorded when that knowledge update occurred, and we also, if it's a significant update, um, send um, reminders to them that they have to acknowledge that this change has occurred to, um, to, to try to manage that part of the, um, of the documentation process. I'm fascinated by that comment because what I was going to raise is related to it. Um, it harkens back to something Liz said earlier. Um, I'm interested to know in CDS, uh, non-genomic CDS, how is the, the never mind um, done and pushed out? That is to say, this wonderful decision support we provided to you for your patient a year and a half ago that told you to do these things. Now, we don't think that really matters anymore. Um, my impression is that that is generally unappreciated by clinicians. Um, and I, again, wonder about precedence, because we're going to deal with that a lot unless we restrict ourselves to a tiny, tiny, tiny subset of things that we're nearly certain about. And so if we're going to get into that, what's the experience in CDS of undoing prior decision supports assertions that were made. Others can help, as uh, the case may be. You know, I, I think the, the truth of it is today is that most of the clinically oriented clinical decision support in practice is very cross-sectional. It's at a point in time. It has not really evolved in a sophisticated way to be a longitudinal sort of model or stateful model of decision support. Um, so what happens is if there's an update to the knowledge base, for example, a new drug drug alert or, or, or drug symptom allergy condition interaction, simply a new alert is provided. And the physician, the expectation is then from a provider's point of view, you know, that was then, this is now. So at the risk of, of being, uh, uh, turning it completely over to the Vanderbilt folks, I'm going to go with Josh to talk to this point and then Dan. So I was just going to um, add that we've run across this problem uh, operationally because we uh, release new uh, drug gene interactions uh, in an environment where uh, a number of people are already on the drug, um, and then we also remap um, our variants to a new interpretation. Um, and so we've handled this a variety of ways. Sometimes it's manually, um, which of course is very labor intensive. Uh, uh, we take advantage of our clinical messaging system. Um, so we, we obviously need uh, good systematic ways uh, to handle that scenario that you describe. Um, I, I think that when the, the information is sufficiently important, it is appreciated by providers. Uh, in our case, there was a number of uh, patients on high dose Invastatin, and we were starting to release SLCO1B1, and, and we successfully uh, managed that transition by uh, contacting providers and patients sometimes directly. I wanted to ask a completely boneheaded question because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a CDS guy, uh, and I'm about to make that really clear. I, I want to know what discussion it is we're having here, <clears throat> and by that I mean the the CDS that Josh describes is all about interacting with physicians who are prescribing drugs, and it's an ongoing dynamic process. The process that Heidi is describing is a lab report. It's a genetic test result that is delivered once to a chart, and it has to be interpreted, it has to be readable, it has to be transportable, it has to be accessible to the family, but it's not a dynamic process in, in the same sense as we're changing drugs all the time. So, so I'm not even sure that, that C, G, C, sorry, G, C, D, S applies to the cardiomyopathy patient or the deaf patient or the cancer susceptibility patient. That's a lab report that, that somebody has ordered and some physician needs to interpret along with the lab and, and it may, the, the interpretation may change, but it's not conceptually the same thing as ordering clopidogrel or del suddenly delivering SLCO1B1 data and, and having physicians having to sort of on the fly figure out what's going on. So that's, I want to know what CDS. Well, Heidi, what do we mean by CDS in this context? Right. So Heidi, I have you in the queue. So uh, why don't you respond to that initially? Yeah. So I, you know, I think I think you're right, Dan. There is some differences, but at the same time, so for example, 
when we issue a genetic report that set on a somatic tumor that says this patient has a variant that will make them sensitive to tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and that leads to the patient being put on that drug, but then the next week a report comes out and says, no, 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 that variant is not making them, you were wrong, we then issue an update and say, got it wrong, this variant is actually not, and that the patient might be taken off that drug. So there is some similarity. There, there's, there, I mean, that, that example is just like the clopidogrel example. I, 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 I concede, makes it sound like we're arguing, and I don't think we're arguing, but, but when you sort of deliver a, a, a genetic test result, it's, and I'm not, I'm not trying to sort of uh, devalue the effort that goes into those results, because I, mean, I, I know, as you know, how hard those interpretations are, but it, it, it's conceptually a little bit different. Well, the other scenario, and this gets back to Les's question about when do you take away alerts, essentially. So I view it more in the way Blackbird said, it's, it's, it's like a new alert, and one thing we do is if we've reported a variant as likely pathogenic, um, but then we later discover it's benign, in some ways that's like saying no, this is no longer relevant, right? And so we deliver those, this variant is now classified as benign, and that often completely changes how the physician cares for the family because instead of all the family members coming in for constant monitoring of their risk for that variant that's now been changed to benign, they can stop doing that. So, you know, it, it is, it can be fairly dynamic depending on the actual utility of the inf genetic information in those reports. I certainly see a lot of the same principles operating in both of those uh, use cases. Uh, the time element is obviously uh, different, but I think uh, th there are similar themes, uh, at least from my perception. Alex, I had you next. Well, speaking to the theme of time, uh, as Jim pointed out, you know, genomic information is unique in that last uh, human lifetime, maybe relevant for generations. Somatic mutations in tumors, uh, perhaps not. But there are layers of other omic information, like epigenomic, uh, uh, you know, liquid biopsies, uh, and so on, that may also have a, a shorter time span in terms of value of the information for the care of the patient. But that information may be valuable for a knowledge discovery, so it may still need to be retained for that other purpose. So these two purposes of knowledge discovery, uh, value of that relatively transient information for knowledge discovery versus information of relevance for patient care need to be kind of decoupled and considered separately. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make a comment not related to the last exchange, but just a plug for um, the use of other types of data to optimize genomic CDS. And the area that I'm thinking about is, is risk prediction, susceptibility to disease, where the models will likely have an element of genomics, but also need to pull data from other areas of the EMR to, uh, that, are, that are part of those risk prediction models and actually may need to even pull data directly from the patient, such as family history. So. Um, I think a lot of this discussion is focused on the elements of genomic variant data and how that is pushed to the clinician in a, in a, in a, in a decision report, uh, clinical decision support rules are uh, um, derived for them, but there are clearly going to be situations where many other data elements need to be pulled in to optimize that, uh, that paradigm. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely uh, correct, and, and to some degree, I think some of the discussion that, that Ken was relating earlier is that, um, you know, while it, it may not be within the purview of this specific group or this specific discussion to consider all other, you know, data elements, the reality is that to be able to contextualize, uh, we have to be able to combine uh, uh, disparate um, elements that the genomic information is not going to be determinative in the vast majority of cases, probably even with highly penetrant single uh, uh, variants. Uh, in genes like BRCA, they're not going to be solely determinative. There are going to be other factors. I, I can say for the purposes of discussion, and I think this is true in our definition of genomic medicine that we generally use, is that family history is inclusive as part of genomic medicine. I think that family history data suffer from many of the same uh, issues that we've talked about with genomic data in terms of the lack of promulgated standards and, and, and these sorts of things. So uh, in some sense, I would, I would be inclusive of family history data within the context of, uh, of, uh, of the genomic data discussion. But the, the, what that opens up is, um, is an element of where do you get the data from, and if the patient now is now an active component of 
data that's important for clinical decision making. Um, that's a whole area of standardization and issues that we ha have to have to grapple with as well. Right, and so that uh, that is something that we really haven't touched on. Is, is you know, I, well, we have touched on it to some degree, I think, in terms of at least in the broader context of uh, you know where do we you know direct the clinical decision support rule to draw data from, that's a data sourcing issue. Uh, and we talked uh, uh, about that in terms of reliability and, and validity, uh, attaching that type of information to the data element per se. And so I think that um, in the bro if we think about that in a broader context, then patient-tendered data like family history or, or uh, other things that we're increasingly relying on um, uh, in clinical care. Um, could also be annotated with, um, uh, we need to point the CDS here, but here, this is a patient source data, and here's what we know about the reliability of that particular uh, data element. So, yeah, I think those are, those are very good points. I had Casey next. So I guess um, along the same lines of trying to pull together data from multiple sources, um, we're uh, with genomic information and, and genomic genetic conditions, uh, a lot of times we're dealing with, with rare conditions, and so being able to leverage some of these um, ontologies that relate uh, phenotypes and um, conditions with, uh, with important genes um, will, be, will be more useful. So when it comes to documentation, um, how, do, how do we leverage that to, um, to, to identify patients who should, should be um, flagged as having decision support, as well as identifying patients who should be aggregated for discovery-based um, uh, based questions as well. So, so to, to address the, the issue of the difference between a laboratory re report and the pharmacogenetics decision, in the um, CSER um, EMR working group, we've been discussing this for several months. Um, and we've come to the conclusion that it's not a very surprising conclusion. There are many different forms of genetic information and use scenarios, and the decision support rules that would fire off the different scenarios are very different. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that there, there's still underlying issues um, about the structuring of the data and reporting the data, um, even when the, the, the decision support rules may be very, very different. And, and sometimes it can be confusing when one person talks about something that, that may be really only relevant to pharmacogenetics, and some of another comment happens that may be really only uh, relevant to germline mutations, another one, be but there, there are, uh, to reiterate what, what Mark said, there are commonalities between all of these. Um, and um, so just for those who aren't, aren't aware of the CDS um, kind of realm that, the differences um, between these can, can be um, addressed by having different firing rules. Clearly, you would, you would have somebody getting tested for pre, a prenatal. Um, there, there may be some genetics that are only applicable to prenatal care, where you know, the only time that a, a decision support rule would flag would be when the person comes into their ob for a prenatal or a first pregnancy visit where they say, oh, this person is, is a carrier of cystic fibrosis mutation, has their partner been screened, and would never ever fire at any other time because it's really irrelevant to their clinical care for every other situation. Um, the same thing may be true for breast cancer risk. Um, whether you're talking about a overall risk score or a, um, or, or a specific variant, um, where a decision support rule may be developed to say that um, you know, this, this rule will only flag um, either when a physician requests the breast cancer risk to be reevaluated or when there's a dramatic change in the, the apparent risk of that individual because of some reclassification event. Um, and maybe even only then if somebody has previously queried f for that risk. Um, so, so, so there are many types of decision support rules that can, can fire off of many different types of genetic information and, and um, just for future discussion, sometimes it can be useful to clarify um, what type of genetic information you're talking about, whether it's pharmacogenetic information or whether, it, whether it's um, cancer genetics, um, because some issues only reply, apply to one or the other. Yeah, and I think that uh, the other thing I would note is that, you know, we're, uh, 
again, and not unexpectedly, we're sort of straying into, you know, knowledge representation around variants. And an example of this would be, you know, uh, CYP2C9 star 3, where we've traditionally thought about this from the perspective of how does this influence warfarin dosing. But with a recent publication out of Taiwan that says, um, hey, wait a second, this may be a risk factor for uh, adverse, uh, severe cutaneous uh, adverse events uh, in, uh, if a patient's exposed to phenytoin. Well, the variant representation doesn't change, but the knowledge around that has to be contextualized in terms of am I doing warfarin or am I doing phenytoin? And we're going to have examples where both of those, of course, are pharmacogenomic, but we're going to have examples where a given variant will influence pharmacogenomics but could also impact uh, risk or other things. Um, an example would be uh, perhaps some of the uh, variants in RYR1 where you have um, uh, there are specific pharmacogenomic implications of that, but it could also be, you know, for a patient that presents in the ER with, uh, um, you know, with what may be, you know, heat exhaustion, you say, hey, this person's at risk for, you know, going into a full-blown uh, full uh, malignant hyperthermia, which is a di very different clinical context. So, uh, so, so again, you know, if this is the tension between we can represent the variant and we need to represent it, but then we need to attach, um, you know, the knowledge uh, uh, to that as well. I think I had Ken next. Just uh, more of a question, um, and I see Clem's here, so um, specifically want to ask this. It seems like there's a, in the typical distance sport realm, in terms of these kind of results, you think of it as OBR, OBX, you know, a, a grouper with a, uh, individual uh, nested elements with LOINC as the, as the agreed upon approach to identifying what it is you're asking the question about, and the answer can be various things, and if it's coded, typically might be SNOMED, for example. I'm wondering, is there, does it seem like we can use that same paradigm in genomics, or does, does that paradigm break uh, when we get here? Yeah, uh, well, we get now almost routinely requests from the kit makers uh, for loin codes. But there's, there's some challenges at lower down, you know, like the kit makers, and I'm totally, we got to have seek, you know, ref seeks with these. And they don't usually say anything about ref seek. I mean, sort of some, and then there's a lot of variability in how they conceptualize alleles, you know, have squished two allele reports in one field or they have two separate fields. FDA could help a lot on that side of it if they would just sort of give some guidance on it. So in those things, I think we can. And then when you get to the, the, the JIGO reports, you know, where you're doing the whole sequence of the whole genome or a lot of, a lot of the genome, it gets more complicated. There is a structure, HL7 is proposed, which uses link codes, which lets you repeat a whole bunch of fields. You know, you do repeating loops, and you can say all the things you want to say. Um, and, and there's actually a lot of activity in HL7 in this space. So I'm not sure how it'll all fall out, but right now it's mostly narrative reports is what you're getting for the real complicated one, which is useless. And I think we'd go a little bit if we just said, okay, if you got a mutation analysis, first you always report ref tweak. Uh, you should always report mutations in quotes, or big ones you found. Uh, you should probably do it more than one way. HCVS is best it can be. I just come to understand ClinVar is probably the ideal code where, they, where it's available. and, and um, the SNP ID. I mean, you'd have three things for all of them, at least, because it's evolving. And then always report the ones you look for if it's probe-based, or report the area you looked at if it's not. But we're not even close in that area right now. But one other thing, there's a lot of things that aren't reporting the genetic mutations, and we brought up the prenatal stuff, and there are now four ways to test for um, bad things in babies on mother's plasma. Looking at DNA in the mother's plant, it's, it's, it's wild and it's dazzling, actually. And it's like 99% accuracy. They're reporting probabilities. And some are Bayesian. They actually say they're Bayesian. So there's another layer uh, that, and then they do it a lot of different ways. One to 2,000, you know, and some little bit of standardization go a long way. If we, but we got to get them to line up. I was just going to mention that uh, we've been uh, 
using the HL7 clinical genomic standard to encode some of our drug gene interaction results. And um, uh, we appreciate the work that's gone into it, and, I, and it's successful for a lot of the uh, drug gene interactions we uh, report, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to represent uh, the remainder or a large uh, variety of genomic scenarios, so including the one you mentioned where uh, there's uh, the CYP2C9, STAR3 has multiple overall interpretations depending on the context. So I think that um, that should be a focus uh, going forward. We, we're, we're properly discussing standardization of the rules and back-end knowledge databases. I guess one question I have is, especially given the importance of clinician workflow, alert fatigue, that it's sort of floundering a little bit because of them feeling overwhelmed. Should we seek greater standardization or at least recommendations on the actions of genomic CDS? And by that I mean perhaps there's interruptive, non-interruptive, there's user-based color schemes, there's certain points in the workflow of certain triggers, and, and I don't see too much standardization in that, that department. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good point. We may uh, want to uh, tee that up, um, particularly in the implementation session this afternoon, since that I think really gets into that the whole user interface, user uh, interaction. So if it's all right to maybe put that in the parking lot for, for a bit, uh, that would be great. Alex. Uh, speaking about HGVS identifiers, uh, it's very non-trivial to map them from the literature because the gene names are missing. And that's actually a, a case of a wider issue where genomic data is indexed by the genome. So whether we're talking about amino acid sequences or transcripts or genomic DNA itself, genome and reference assemblies serve now as an index for information. So it's uh, important to acknowledge that, uh, that utility of the genome and then to uh, facilitate data integration by providing means to relate any molecular information to genomic coordinates. At least currently in the queue, I'm going to put Chris Shute on the spot because I'm stunned that with the word standards being uh, flung around as frequently uh, as it has been, that Chris hasn't uh, uh, immediately started drooling and, and foaming at the mouth. So uh, Chris, if you want to weigh in on uh, maybe even just the current status and how much you think um, the standards world is relevant to what we're trying to do here. Fair enough. I, I actually was heartened to hear our colleague from ONC talk about the SIMI and FIRE initiatives for the clinical information. I, I certainly endorse and concur that that does seem to be the mainstream. Uh, with respect to genomic standards, we are yet inchoate, I think, at least with respect to clinical implementation. Uh, and as Bob Frymouth has, has basically instructed me in the past several months, uh, our notation and nomenclature for genomic variants is, how do we phrase this, immature, unreliable, and not sustainable as a clinically deployable or implementable uh, reference point. I mean, clearly things like the star allele infrastructure are collapsing under their own weight, uh, and it seems uh, self-evident that energy and resources as pertinent to this genomic uh, problem uh, and decision support w should be invested in the question of how the heck do we maintain a national slash international reference uh, representation of uh, <coughs> genomic variation that can in turn be embedded in redistributable logic uh, specifications for CDS and others, and more pertinently, can be reliably and reproducibly integrated into clinical systems. So I just wanted to follow up on that comment. Uh, this question of how do we unambiguously define a variant, um, it's a really important one, and for a while I was focused on sort of defining genomic reference sequence and can we define it by the genomic coordinates, but as much as that seems simple and straightforward, those of us who work in that space know it's not. Um, and in working with the ClinVar team at NCBI for a while now, um, they have been behind the scenes assigning a variant ID, Jim can speak to this, 
to every variant. And sometimes that's a collection of, you know, a haplotype almost like in the star allele world, right? These two together define this star allele that is clinically relevant. And I, so we've now gotten to the point where the only place you see that right now is in the URL in ClinVar and asking them to put that front and center because I think that that might be a paradigm to actually use in clinical decision support, that we truly define what we mean as a clinically relevant variant that can have a lot of variability, unfortunately, with a single ID that can be transmitted and used within healthcare IT systems. And, and that I'll just put that out there because we've been talking about it extensively within the ClinGen project as an idea. Yeah, th that's a good point. Thanks, Heidi. That's, uh, it, that brings up a number of issues that currently aren't resolved, uh, as you know. And, and there's debate in the uh, community about the degree to which pre-coordinated or post-coordinated um, uh, systems should be used to represent this sort of information. And, and I think that's probably getting a little bit deeper than we need to right now, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. What I would like to do is, since we're starting to run a little bit low on time, make sure that we touch on the last two questions that were assigned to this session. I think we've hit the third one uh, a little bit uh, in this present discussion, and we touched on the previous one, uh, that is question two, um, in our last discussion, but I want to loop back to it for just a, a few minutes. Uh, question two talks about the massive nature of, of genetic data um, and how that might influence development and the implementation of genomic uh, CDS. Um, again, I want to remind everyone that there is an upcoming session. Session number three is going to focus on implementation, so we don't need to necessarily hit all those points right now. But if we could talk about the data issues uh, that are relevant to this, I think that would be helpful. One of the things that, um, that I wanted to point out is if you reference your sheet, uh, Desiderata item number two talks about lossless compression. Uh, that is certainly a factor here that we could consider. Um, another thing that has come up that, uh, that I'd like to call out for possible, as a possible seed for discussion here, is whether we should be designing our systems for the ideal state um, rather than the current technological or architectural uh, limitations that we currently see uh, within the systems we have. And that would be looking at do we, uh, for example, taking uh, Desiderata number two as the example here, do we subset our data uh, by policy, because we think clinically uh, that that is the right thing to do, or do we do it for performance reasons? To comment on the, um, do we go for the perfect state versus um, what would fit into the current environment? This is something that we all run into. Uh, a lot of the things we're working on behalf of ONC and CMS, it comes up all the time. Do we? For example, if it's a quality measure or distance sport, do we model a data element the way we think it should be in the EHR, or do we model it the way it is in the EHR? Because there's significant pain when you say, well, we'll talk about data in a way that's not actually in the EHR, but we think EHR should represent. I think it's a similar kind of notion. I think it should be done very, very carefully, and only if the benefits clearly outweigh the costs, because bottom line, perfect is great, but we first need to get to good. Yeah, so I really think for this question, we do have to go back to the concept of do we separate the clinical decision support from the research itself. For subsetting data for clinical decision support, I actually see that that could be something that we could do and it would actually be a benefit to healthcare providers. But from the research perspective and trying to find the new variants that are actually involved with disease, I, we have to have the full data sets. And so, to me, you really have to separate out those two use cases, I brought that term in, uh, and, and really make decisions about how we, we store and use data. And part of that, and this came up for those of you who were at the AMIA policy meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a fairly extensive discussion about this, but, you know, we are really talking about big data analytics. And so how we want to use data from a research perspective versus how we want to use data from a clinical perspective is really now starting to separate. When HIPAA was written, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, and we weren't trying to figure out how to use data analytics to start doing discovery. Today we have the human genome and those other types of things, and so it really, I think, is going to be important for us to have that separation so that we can maybe get around or modify some of the HIPAA and high tech rules that allow us to actually do analysis to really focus on 
what is clinically actionable and therefore what should be involved with clinical decision support. Um, as, I, as we both thought about this and wrote about it, the, um, the idea of um, a better, uh, more perfect knowledge representation standard actually attaches nicely to the not yet extant public library, right? So since that thing doesn't exist, what the books on the shelf would look like also doesn't exist. And so you have a kind of clean sheet of paper for having a more full-featured knowledge representation with the expectation that every organization is going to have to have some kind of ETL, you know, transform to take that thing into what really works in their own environment. So rather than shooting for an operational common denominator that's quite heterogeneous and quite low, you actually could have a more full-featured but independent, um, and naturally independent because it's hosted by another organization on behalf of the entire community and the future expectation of the use of the data. So you, in a sense, you can dodge the question <laughs> by virtue of the clean sheet of paper that's offered for how you would, uh, where it would live and where, how you would maintain it. That sounds like a very governmental approach of kicking the can down the road. I like that. Uh, uh, Jim? Uh, so I was just wanted to speak to the sort of massive nature question and some of the comments that were just made about uh, big data analytics that, and uh, that so far uh, most of our discussion has really been about germline um, variants. And obviously somatics listed here, that's much more fluid, many more uh, times of sampling, it's actually more data. Um, we haven't brought up uh, RNA-seq, we haven't brought up epigenomics, and uh, we haven't brought up the microbiome, um, all of which are basically approached by similar technologies, and all of which we see massive scale up in terms of sort of agnostic, high throughput, whole sample uh, types of data. And, um, and I would throw out for context, in case you're not aware, um, we're involved in a number of projects with CDC and FDA to use whole genome sequencing for pathogen surveillance, where FDA is sequencing the shipping containers and the restaurant salad bars. Um, CDC is sequencing um, clinical samples that come to them as part of re reporting. And we've already, there's already, it, it, in fact, it's so powerful that already there have been regulatory actions based on the pilot. Um, which isn't even standardized yet. Be uh, and in addition to greater sensitivity, what they're seeing is the power of historical samples that they've found, for example, uh, clinical uh, isolates which are matching historical samples from food processing plants, um, which are suggesting that if the food processing plant wasn't totally cleaned up, it wasn't uh, cleared out, and now it's back. Um, and so if we're expecting, uh, so that's, that's a pooling question which is even bigger than what hospitals do. Because say the hospital does the microbiome, you'd still want to pool it with FDA and CDC and global surveillance, and there will be healthcare decisions from that. So I just throw that out to sort of pull us back up to the sort of unique issues about this, which is scale. I assert that none of that stuff is going to be in the electronic medical record. Um, all of it should be pooled, um, all of it should be persistent, um, and all of it should be reprocessed periodically as new algorithms and approaches to data discovery are found, and, and each time you do the reprocessing of the whole thing, you will find stuff you didn't see before that somebody might want to know about. So um, just throwing that out for your consideration for question two. And so one of the things that occurs in, in that discussion, I had flagged it in, in some of the, I think it was when we were uh, in, the, in the first session, was the idea of that there seems to be, you know, there seem to be public health aspects of what it is that we're talking about here. Um, and to some degree, um, you know, at least a, a potential um, output, and, and I don't mean to jump to day two here, but at least in terms of flagging it is, um, you know, what is the, you know, the role of, you know, the traditional delivery system, which is, you know, engaged in the public's health, 
uh, versus the public health system, which we tend to compartmentalize into, well, they do disease surveillance and they do immunizations and this sort of thing. You know, I think we all recognize that, you know, everybody's in when it comes to public health, um, but we've not really been systematic about how we, how we do that. And, and, you know, would this be an opportunity for study uh, about, uh, about how to do that? I think, um, Clem, did you have something that you wanted to interject uh, uh, at this point? I just was talking to my boss out in the hallway, so I didn't hear the discussion. <laughs> But I'm sure I'd, I would. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, let you, we'll let you get caught up, and then we'll, we'll get you back in. So Brian, I think. So the, when you're talking about, um, we're talking about kind of a push and a pull mechanism where you have the underlying data that in, in some yet, as yet undefined box um, that, that perhaps does not live in the EHR because the EHR can't handle that data, at least right now, and maybe not even the clinicians don't want to handle that data. Um, and with the, push, with the push mechanism then, you know, somebody orders it or somebody decides at one level that this data needs to, needs to get put in the EHR, get put in a level where this clinical decision support is firing off of it. We talk about a pull mechanism where the decision support rule is saying there's something out there that um, it, there's, there, there's a, a piece of information that potentially um, no one's asked for, but might be necessary or might be useful, and that can be very powerful. But also, we're moving into the the there. You're moving into the realm of of screening. I'm um, moving into the realm of public health, like, like like Mark mentioned. And I just want to submit that the, the 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 one of the reasons for not necessarily wanting to go there, except in very specific instances, is that um, usually for screening there needs to be a much higher level of evidence. Um, and the reason why is because once you enter into screening, then any incidental finding, um, any adverse event is iatrogenic. Um, and um, so I think that, that there are, um, I, I, I love Dan Macy's desiderata of saying that, it's, that, that that level of information needs to live separately in the HR for, for many reasons, for not just technical reasons, but I think there's also health reasons why um, that level of information needs to be separate, and there should be concerns about um, being able, having automatic systems that query this underlying information um, beyond whether it's validated, beyond whether it's, even if it is validated, even if it is robust, um, then the, the level of evidence that needs to be there for, um, for doing this querying of the information to, to have unrequested, um, results, uh, unrequested alerts be fired, un unrequested information be, be queried, um, really needs to be much, much higher. It's nice to hear an informaticist uh, that's conversant with Bayes' theorem, because it seems like a lot of my genetics colleagues tend to forget that very point, which is extremely well taken. Uh, Les. I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I don't actually see that that's what we're currently doing in areas outside of genomics and medicine. Uh, in that we have different standards for deliberate prospective screening than we do for incidentally acquired information. And I think the chest X-ray nodule is the best example of that. Everyone agrees that it's inappropriate to screen the population with chest X-rays to find such nodules uh, because we know that the yield of that is terrible. And yet it is uniformly, as far as I'm aware, uh, practice across the entire field of radiology that when an x-ray is done for another reason, if such a lesion is identified, it is reported. So I think that, and this, we do the same thing with the physical exam. Um, we find skin bumps all the time and we deal with those. And we don't set out to do population-wide screening for little skin bumps. So I think we have to acknowledge that when you have the information, you have different obligations than when you set out prospectively to acquire information. Uh, that, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about, and, and so it's saying that we, we should not develop a system that does MRI, that's, that does the genetic equivalent of MRIs on every, everyone um, for the, that exact reason. And we don't want to, we don't want to, um, we, we don't want, we don't want to develop a system that identifies every possible incidental finding on every individual, but we need to be very aware of when we're looking for those and when we're not. 
Yeah, and I think that this is an important issue, but um, uh, one that there's a potential for us in this discussion to, you know, get uh, potentially bogged down and distracted in the sense that um, I think we should take the approach much as CPIC um, uh, guidelines do, which is to say, uh, if we have the information, uh, for whatever reason, um, and we want to use it, then how can we leverage clinical decision support to actually do that so that we, uh, you know, can kind of focus our discussion around that aspect and not address what is clearly a very important uh, concept, but perhaps it, for the purposes of this meeting, a bit out of bounds. Well, I'm just addressing that if th that some of this genetic information which we might have, we might not want, we, we might need to pretend we don't have. Um, or that we might need to ha have it, but only should it be queried, as opposed to saying we have it and we've analyzed it and we are ob obliged to report on it. Right, and, and tho those of us that are involved in these discussions as Caesar and Emerge, and, and God knows there's been a, a lot of uh, ink spilled, um, uh, the equivalent of blood spilled, on that very uh, that contentious battlefield. And so I'd, I'd just as soon not recreate the Battle of Hastings at this meeting and, and, and let my uh, uh, ELC, uh, ELSI colleagues uh, uh, do that. But I, it is an important point not to uh, forget. And, it, and I think as that you know, becomes adjudicated or, or perhaps a standard emerges, assuming that that's the case, then that will be relevant to inform how uh, CDS is applied. Um, Bob or Jim? Oh. Oh. Uh, so one of the things that I've noticed uh, throughout the morning's discussion here is that although we've touched on it a few different times, there's one topic that has not come up uh, explicitly, or at least as explicitly as I, I was thinking it might, and that's the issue around provenance. So we've talked quite a bit about uh, how rapidly knowledge can change uh, and the impact that that has on the interpretation and uh, use of genomic data. but. I'm wondering if we have, uh, we've got maybe 10 minutes if we're lucky here, maybe a little bit less. Uh, I'm wondering if we could have a brief discussion on what sort of provenance might be needed, um, and, and I guess metadata could be thrown into that, around not just the genomic data, but the methods used to produce it, to analyze it, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think right now that's critical. Uh, the different technologies, uh, different algorithms, the way you set up the algorithms as far as the way the parameters are set, uh, you know, it makes reproducibility a huge issue. Uh, we've seen this, of course, in the microarray world uh, where, you know, things are not reproducible generally, but a lot of that is because we don't have the rich metadata that we really need to do the reproducible, re to reproduce those experiments. So I think it's absolutely critical that we set up a standardized metadata structure that not only allows us to capture what platforms uh, the, the experiments were being done on, uh, but also exactly what the parameters of the algorithms were and what the algorithms were down to the version levels so that we can basically, you know, any healthcare provider can reproduce that analysis if they want to. I mean, I just, I think it's just critical. And I would say that um, a number of the diagnostic entities that are doing this clinically, obviously we do register and store that data down to that very fine-grained level, and many people are working on addressing um, standards in, in that area. Of course, one of the problems is even if you know exactly what pipeline and which tools and which versions and which reference data someone used, the next time you go in and sample that same patient, you get a different sample of the possible DNA from that population, you're not necessarily guaranteed to get the same result. Well, along that line, I was at, there was a meeting last week, uh, the FDA hosted, and there was a session on the genome in a bottle, and it's a group that's trying to, you know, really be nail down the precision, and I was kind of shocked. They were reporting 10, 5, 10 percent differences across platforms, because when you get a billion samples, you don't have to have a, you, you can have a teeny error rate and still get a lot of funny stuff. Yeah, I think the, the paper from the Stanford group uh, where they looked at, um, you know, same patients and looked at uh, two different uh, sequencing platforms and then even resequencing on the same platform, you know, it, it's those types of things that um, should make us all very circumspect about, you know, the enthusiasm with which we move this into the clinic. 
but we also have to recognize the fact that there are many of us that are not daunted uh, by these, you know, sorts of things that, you know, the, the, the push as is frequent with new technology in, in this country is that we move it out into the clinical space uh, for a variety of, of reasons, be they intellectual, economic, or, or whatever. So in some ways, uh, I think this is a, a, a critical uh, issue to address is that, um, you know, we're, we're giving you information, we're giving you instructions about the information, um, but how confident uh, should you be? And particularly when we're talking about interventions that can be, uh, you know, life-changing relating to prophylactic surgery and things of this nature, uh, I think that's why a number of us are, you know, saying we have to do additional steps of validation, both on the laboratory side to be certain that what we're calling as a variant is truly there, but also to try and contextualize that using as much other information as we can uh, before we actually act on a clinical decision. And I think only a subset of those activities can realistically be put into a clinical decision support uh, system, other than to say, hey, before you uh, start to make decisions, you might want to consider these, uh, these different things to do. Alex. Uh, managing information about validity uh, or whether the data is validated or not may be an important aspect. So validated data may be required for clinical decision making, but non-validated data may still be useful for research purposes. And that may argue that we may need to both record a level of uh, reliability, you know, whether data is validated, but also to keep also the data that's not validated. Perhaps that information is not fit for electronic health records, but may be fit for another repository of genomic information that accompanies it. You know, and that's a, uh, a really interesting point, and, and, and you know, Terry and, and Eric might want to weigh in on this, because we've certainly in a number of contexts with NHGRI have talked about the idea of how can we utilize um, information out of clinical transactions and how can we close the, um, you know, the, the loop so that we can not only push things out in the clinical environment but capture uh, information uh, from that and how do we then, um, you know, appropriately uh, represent this as, you know, clinically valid versus more discovery, um, it, you know, can be problematic. But it seems like an area where we've had some discussions in, in other contexts about this and, and I'd be interested in just in your perspective in terms of where you think um, you know, genome is currently at uh, from that. Yeah, I, I think you've described well where, where we are, which is <laughs> we're, we're wondering how best to do this. I, you know, I think we have a few programs, Ignite and Emerge being, being probably the main ones that will allow us to capture some of that, at least we hope so, in their, in their incarnations. Um, but we don't do this well and, and need to find a better way. Thanks. Um, a little unrelated, but um, it'll be answer and question. We're trying to define a theoretical ideal state, and that'll be terribly valuable in a contribution. Regarding the goals of the conference, are we also trying to identify those open complex issues that would benefit from further research, study, pilot tests, and for this topic at hand, are there research or targeted pilot tests that would be useful to determining the optimal forms of genomic data types or CDS? Yeah, so the, the um, I think your uh, question is that yes, we, we, we would like to identify potential targets of opportunity, you know, whether it be for definitional aspects or, or, or pilot projects or, or those types of things. So hopefully in the synthesis from this session and also from the broader um, uh, overall meeting, we would love to come away with some things that we say, here are some, some really good uh, ideas that could be potentially um, um, uh, studied systematically. Yeah. Jamie. No, no, no. This, I'll just make this really brief. Um, it's a question that maybe we can talk about during the next session when we're talking about implementation, but we talked about the idea of metadata, um, and when we brought it up, we immediately went to the front end of knowledge generation in terms of the validity and quality of data. Um, this is just a harebrained scheme, but 
uh, and I don't know if this has been a discussion anywhere else, but the idea, I want to inter introduce the idea of using metadata around CDS rules to match with what the physician or what, you know, is being looked at on the EHR so that, you know, that might, you know, address some of the alert fatigue. And um, so I'll just leave it at that and maybe we can talk about it at the next session. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think there needs to be a lot more thought put into what sort of information is captured um, in a time-dependent fashion as knowledge is changes in CDS rules are written and re, uh, revised. Um, so knowing that we are now at the end of our allotted time for the discussion section here, we've got a few minutes here for uh, what's been titled Wrap Up and Summary. Uh, which, what's, which is going to be fairly informal. I've, I've tried the best I can to take notes during the session here. I'll, I'll go through a few of the things that I've highlighted, and then I invite my uh, co-moderators here to, to, to pick up as well. But knowing that uh, we now stand between all of you and lunch, uh, we will try to keep this uh, succinct. So some of the themes that I heard coming out of the discussion over the last um, hour and a half or so uh, are as follows. First of all, uh, we recognize there are different types of decision support. Not everything is an active interruptive alert. There is also more of a passive mechanism uh, that might be more akin to a, a traditional um, lab report. Uh, and that these different types of, of CDS may not require different types of data or different representations of data, uh, but may simply operate on the same set of data um, in different ways. Uh, there was a great phrase that I wrote down because I, I, uh, I thought I captured the essence uh, perfectly. What does the CDS engine fire off of? That's at the core of what we're trying to discuss here. Um, we talked about uh, the knowledge that's needed uh, and that it will potentially vary by the different uh, CDS rules. Uh, this includes the very basic information about the genomic variants that are found, the sites that are interrogated, and how that information is interpreted or assessed. Um, it, and that we are currently missing, we as a community are missing standard interpretations that can be fed into these CDS engines. Uh, and that in some cases, in fact, uh, in the future it may be that in many cases, the triggers are not going to be traditional drug orders as we think of in the pharmacogenomic communities, but actually the triggers will become new knowledge. Uh, that new knowledge, we said, uh, uh, would uh, most likely be made available on demand uh, as a pull mechanism rather than a, as through a push model to avoid overloading. Uh, I think that's a, an important point to keep in mind because it turns on its head some of what uh, may be considered traditional practice in this way. Uh, we have uh, a quality issue. Uh, we need to keep in mind that not all calls and interpretations are at the same level of confidence, uh, nor is that same level of rigor needed in all clinical contexts. Uh, that's something else that is potentially new to this space. Uh, in addition, patients are mobile. Uh, we need to be able to maintain their data over time and share it among providers as those patients move around. Uh, questions are related to creating centralized repositories uh, for knowledge on a population scale. This is something that most certainly would not be feasible for each care facility to do on their own. There are also legal obligations that we need to keep in mind, especially with respect to reinterpretations of genomic data and what impacts that has for uh, follow-up with patients. Uh, there was recognition, of course, that genomic data and the interpretations may be valid not only for a patient's lifetime, which is by itself a, an interesting aspect to genomic data compared to some other types of lab measurements, but also that this data may have relevance to immediate family members and descendants. Uh, and so there are some unique aspects around maintaining this data and the, the subsequent interpretations for potentially longer than the patient is alive. We recognize that data analytics have advanced significantly, uh, that we need to have a way to analyze the data in context of or perhaps in spite of HIPAA. <laughs> we have uh, uh, different types of genomes, of course. There is the germline, the somatic, uh, microbiome were all mentioned. Uh, there are other aspects to this that simply go beyond uh, what SNP do you have in a particular gene. Uh, 
We talked about the implication towards public health, uh, looking specifically at surveillance and immunizations. Uh, we talked a bit about incidental findings um, and how genomics may or may not be different from other screening mechanisms. Uh, and finally, uh, the last bit that I've pulled out here uh, is related to provenance. Uh, the, the fact that it is critical for our reproducibility and what I've just now dubbed the three Ps, platforms, pipelines, and parameters. <laughs> So in, with that, that is, uh, that's the end of my highlights. I invite my, my co-moderators to add. Um, I think that was a, a very good summary. Um, I would only add that I think uh, in addition to the, um, the, the sort of aspect of sort of changing um, uh, genomic landscape here, uh, I would add that I, I I observed uh, recurring themes here about the fact that there's changing sociology and politics also um, where the existing healthcare model isn't a good fit for the reality of how data is collected and the maximum utility of, uh, of that information uh, pooling across multiple uh, organizations and legal jurisdictions. Um, I would just say that's not unique to this area. I brought up the surveillance as an example of uh, where CDC and FDA suddenly find themselves having to get along um, and uh, where legally there's sort of separated domains there. Um, I think you're seeing it, you know, from the Facebook world to the Google world uh, all over that um, to the NSA, I, I guess we have to add. <laughs> um, and, and so it, we, I, th I think we need to bear in mind when we want to make sort of short-term advances that we're doing this um, in a very changing landscape. And there's no way you're going to plan for that huge pooled future. Um, so you must, if you want anything real, take steps that are within the present world, but bear in mind that it's changing fast. And I think on a couple year time span, the world will look very different. Mark Blackford. Yeah, I um, I think that uh, you highlighted the things that uh, uh, that I um, uh, pulled out as well. I guess I'd just open it up to the group um, uh, to get an endorsement uh, of the uh, key um, things that were pulled out of this particular session. Um, in particular, if there are any points that you think that were very important that we were not captured, or if you have a significant disagreement with. Uh, either something that was captured or how it was captured, this would be the time to, uh, um, to, to raise that. That's right, everybody's got a blood sugar of 40. And um, <laughs> so we will be revisiting these, of course, um, but uh, I think uh, what we'll do at this point is to declare victory um, uh, for this particular uh, key question. I want to uh, really thank um, uh, Bob and Jim for, uh, for doing an excellent job of leading this topic area. I also, uh, in my introductory remarks, neglected to um, uh, thank um, uh, Duke uh, for actually doing all the meeting logistics uh, for uh, GM7. And so that's uh, uh, Jeff Ginsburg, who's the titular face of this, but uh, Teji and, and Rita, uh, who are uh, the, doing all the uh, heavy lifting on this. So please, uh, if you have an opportunity, uh, thank them for their outstanding uh, work. Uh, we will uh, adjourn uh, for uh, lunch, uh, and then we'll reconvene at uh, 1.15. And lunch is out outside. It looks like uh, drinks and desserts are inside.